Hey everyone, my name is Tegan, it works about Sandy Rose. Um, I'm not coping well with the UK weather right now, so sorry if I'm a little shinier, a little fluffier than usual, but it's all good. It is once again the time of the month I wrap up my reading for the previous month, so this is talking about what I've read in July. And every month I start off by saying like, wow, it was such like an underwhelming reading month, I didn't read much, but I've read seven books again and that just seems to be my average now, so it's all good. And I think it felt like I wasn't reading as much as I did just because writing my book has been the only thing that's mattered to me this month because I'm actually enjoying it right now so I've been neglecting reading so every time I would usually spend write, uh, um, reading a book I have spent writing one instead I think I decided I like to start with my 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 overall stats first let's do that again also Storyworth now has this thing where it tells you the average amount of time it takes to finish a book for me it's six days sometimes it's longer because I set a book to currently reading and then read a chapter and forget about it for a week or two so I think at one point my average was 11 days, but now we're down to six for the month, which is a bit more reassuring. So as usual, my top moods for the month are adventurous, mysterious, dark, tense and emotional, but we've had a reflective creep in here for this month. And I'm, I'm trying to guess which book that is. And once again, as usual, my top genres are fantasy, young adult, the age category, which is not a genre, and LGBT. And then I had like one middle grade thriller, short story and horror. My average rating for the month was 3.93. So I had three 3.5 stars, which in my opinion is still a very good book. That's a 7 out of 10. That's a good book. We had two 4 stars and two 4.5 stars, which I believe must have been both my rereads. And then in terms of format, I read one physical book this month which also wasn't on the list of physical books I was aiming to read specifically this year so we've achieved something but not what I was hoping. I have one advanced copy, one um, just ebook in general, two audiobooks which are both rereads and then two library borrow ebooks. Okay, so let's get on to the individual books. The first one I read was The Stolen Air by Olly Holly Billy Black which is probably up on this in this corner hidden behind here somewhere and i reread the cool prince trilogy recently to like get in the mindset for it i read this one because i want to like this year i want to actually finish some of the series i've started and now that prisoner throne is out i think you know let's actually read stolen air and then i can like finish the bog the air and i enjoyed the stolen air but like nowhere near as much as the cool prince i don't think i found the protagonist ren engaging at all and I think so much of the book was spent just them going place to place and having like a very minor, low stakes, no consequence fight scene. What's going on? My neighbour's taking offence apart right now, that's what's going on. So yeah, a lot of like concerning conflict didn't happen in this book until the very end where, you know, the character got an injury. And I was like, wow, something that's actually going to alter the plot. And then she recovered from it. So yeah, I like this book. I'm also, I want a bit more Jude and Cardin content, which I think happens in The Prisoner's Throne, so I'm looking forward to that. Next up, I borrowed The Immeasurable Depth of Youth in the Library, which is a book that I've not heard about or heard anything about. And I think I saw it scrolling on, on one of my library apps. And I thought, yeah, I think I'd like that. I did like it. I gave it four stars. I think it was a natural four stars. It is, how do I describe what it's about? It's about a 15 year old girl who has been, I think heavily implied, I don't remember actually that it says specific websites, but is on Tumblr, has online friends, no real friends, only online friends, that's been like expressing all her anxiety and her depression on Tumblr. And then apparently posted something so concerning, her internet friend snitched to her, to her mum, and her mum shipped her off to her dad in Florida just to have like a social media detox. And our main character, Bryn, is just thinking about death constantly, not just in like a suicidal way, but in a extreme anxiety. I think there might be OCD in that, I can't remember if it's written on page, but the thing about if I don't do anything perfectly, everything's gonna go wrong, gonna go wrong. And like, if I drink this water, what if there's bacteria that kills me in it? What if I go swimming and something gets into a cut that I don't have and I die, that kind of way. So one of the days she goes out like on a paddleboard around the mango trees and Mangroves are my favourite trees, which is a very silly opinion to have. I think they're so cool. So I love the mango tree representation in this book. But yeah, she goes out around the mango trees and meets a girl who's just there, inappropriately dressed for the weather, in the bikini in a full storm. And Bryn just like, hmm, something's up here. And she spends the rest of the book kind of investigating what's going on with this girl. And I enjoyed this book. I love the mental health representation. I love the sapphic vibes. I think she's bisexual, but the kind of implied relationship in this book is sapphic 
And I love anything that like kind of tackles the complexities of human experience with like tenderness and empathy and hope. So this must be the book in my genres that's reflective. Also this month it looks like I started reading an arc. I think I got like two chapters in and I just couldn't get into it. So I'm not going to be sure if I'm coming back to that one. So we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. Also not because it wasn't necessarily bad, I just didn't vibe with the voice. Next book I did finish was my reread of The Drowned Woods by Emily Lloyd-Jones and I am obsessed with- I say I'm obsessed with this woman, I've only read The Bone Houses and The Drowned Woods out of her works. I have The, the Wild Huntress pre-ordered and she definitely has more books- oh no I lied, I read her middle grade Unseen Magic, Unspoken Magic, both those two, very good, very good, love them. And I've said I'm obsessed with them but I think I'm specifically obsessed with like her specific like Welsh folklore retellings and her middle grade because I've not had the urge to venture out into any of the other books yet but maybe I will. And The Drowned Woods I think I originally read as an advanced copy so there's definitely a video of my full review like up on this channel and on my blog but it's like so atmospheric and immersive and a Welsh folklore retelling and I strong female protagonists that I love and they're not they're not nice they're not kind they're they're kind they're kind of mean they kind of hate everyone but I love them they're complex and this is a book that I think when I read it for the first time I did read it in a few days because I just devoured it I fell in love from the first page and couldn't stop reading and I enjoyed it equally as much the second time around and equally as much by audiobook which is always very important to me because I'm rereading a book that I used to love on audiobook right now and I'm just not vibing with the narrator that much I'm thinking like did I actually love this book as much the first time around or is it just a narrator for me? The narrator really changes the experience I'm finding. Next up I read Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross which I think is a book that I probably had on hold at library and every time it gets to my turn I just keep pushing it back. The only Rebecca Ross book I've read so far is Divine Rivals. Is that hers? I think that's hers. And I enjoyed it greatly, I loved it, so I thought you know I'm gonna like branch out to some more. And I could read Ruthless Vows but it's sat in a stack of books of like this massive stack of pre-orders that I'm only opening when I finish writing my book so we'll get around to that. So I read Dreams of I Beneath to like fill the void for now. So I think I went through all of her books on Goodreads and I thought you know I think I'd vibe with this one the most and I did vibe with it. So in extreme summary this book is about a girl who's kind of on the quest along with some other people to break this century old curse that makes people's nightmares come to life. This girl whose name completely escaped- it doesn't escape me, her name's Clementine. Clementine and her father are the dream wardens of this like little village at the base of a mountain and the dream warden because people with nightmares come to life every full moon and people have to like fight them off and protect the village and they're magicians. Then two guys come along kind of like take over the town and send them just like scurrying away to the city for safety where Clementine becomes a dream warden again and she disguises herself to become the like apprentice to one of the guy who overtook her hometown's brother. I think my major issues is, uh, this isn't like too spoilery, it's quite over like early on in the book, is that when Clementine like goes to this woman to enchant herself to look different so she can be in disguise for this guy, she has to give up half of her heart and then something that is like metaphorically half of her heart, which in this case is um, her love for art. And if you give up half of your actual heart, it turns to stone and you become like cold and mean. And I wish these two things had any impact on the plot at all. Because we meet her in the opening chapter and she's drawing something, so we know she has a love for art. But after she gives it up, she kind of just like doesn't talk about it ever again. So it's like completely insignificant to the plot because she has no desire to do art. There's also a brand of magic in this world where you can like enchant, I don't know, paintings or objects to come to life. So she's like, wow, I'm gonna like learn this thing of magic and bring my paintings to life. And then she just, we just don't come back to that thought ever. And she gives up heart, she turns half of her heart to stone. And the woman who does it turns like, yeah, you're gonna become like cold and mean and stuff. And that just doesn't happen. She's lovely. And I think my kind of other, not really issue with this book is because the thing about the nightmares coming to life happens on every full moon so it happens like once a month and this book only takes place over like two or three months so we don't really get much of the selling point for this book for me but I still really enjoyed it I love the characters and the plot and the magic system and all the things like that the concepts I just wish that some things were just a little a little different this is where it turns out I was skim reading the entire time and like all these points were clarified on the page but in my opinion they were not 
Next up, I read an advanced copy of Compound Fracture by Andrew Lloyd White, and you will be, I think sometime next month, I will be posting like a full review of this book. It's an advanced copy I have to bore, so I enjoyed, I enjoyed it greatly. I have things to talk about. So this is a book about like queer identity and trans resilience and social justice in this like Appalachian town village. I don't remember. I don't remember. But mostly going into like, the complexities of rural America and the struggles of marginalized communities in these areas. And the main focus is the well, the on protagonist is trans and he is trying to like survive in this town that like definitely wants him to fail and like push for social change and just become accepted. So yeah, this story is completely gut wrenching and it follows our trans autistic teen who does not have an official diagnosis in the book but has a lot of friends who do have a diagnosis and just like vibe check him to in insanity. And our main character Mal survives an attempted murder which may or may not have been a hate crime and is drawn into this like generational struggle between the rural poor and the people who exploit them. There's a blood feud between Miles's family and the cop's family. And I think I'm gonna try and like, I read this vaguely recently, I still haven't like processed my full perspective on this book yet, I just thought I enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it as much as Andrew Joseph White's horror work, so the spirit bears its teeth and hell followed with us. But that's just because I'm more into horror as a genre rather than what would i describe complex compound fracture as it's kind of like a political thriller i think in a sense and then a lot of compound fracture is people just like kind of like sitting around in their houses having conversations about what they might do and miles is also like haunted by a ghost of a dead miner who's just hanging around i, w I wish he had like he was had a little bit more page time but yeah, love this book. I didn't love it as much as his previous works, but still greatly enjoyed it. Next up is this short story by Rebecca Crundon, who I I I tried googling this name ahead of time to see if it's like a natural like German word. It's all German vibes, I think. To see if I could like pronounce it correctly, and I think the word must have been invented for this book because I can't find anything anywhere. So it could be like Balution, Bal Baluken, Beluken. This word i have no idea how to pronounce it but this is a short story and it's like completely hauntingly beautiful it's like 19 pages long but it has such a classic fairy tale vibe and it's captivating and it's dark and atmospheric it's got like fantasy and horror elements and definitely a strong influence in my opinion of fairy tale and folklore traditions this is a story about a world that's in like a deep famine where um the butcher is the one providing all the meat for the city. At one point, meat was cow and sheep, and now it's mystery meat, as people kind of die and disappear. That's not hugely, uh, actually, yeah, it, it kind of is relevant to the plot. This is very relevant to the plot, I lied, I lied. There's a story about a young girl who goes to a cemetery in this village and calls upon the spirit of our mysterious German instrument's name, who is a spirit of the forest and is going to protect this young girl and her sister to save them from being sold off or married off into the butcher's family or some other family because the parents, I say the parents, I think it's an aunt and uncle, the parents are already dead. The aunt and uncle like can't afford to look after these kids anymore, we're going to sell them off to the mystery meat butcher and save ourselves. And in exchange for this protection, the girl has to exchange something bloody. She has to feed the forest. And yeah, not a whole much about this I can say about this one in the entire plot, as it's such a short story, but it's beautifully written and engaging. And I've read a few of Rebecca Crandon's short stories in the past, but I really need to delve into her novel works because I am enthralled in summary. And my final read of the month was Magic by Angie Sage, which is book one of the Septimus Seat series, and it's these lovely gold books here. These were, these were basically my Harry Potter as a child. These are my favourite books. They're the books that got me interested in reading the fantasy genre when I was well, like 10 years old or something. Books that made me fall in love with reading. They're all like 500 pages long. I'm going to show you one a little bit closer. But it's these shiny gold books that look like spell books. So I think I picked this one up in my school library for the first time and I was like, how can a child resist this? But yeah, it's 500 pages long. It's a middle grade book, but it's like very, it feels kind of advanced for a book that is aimed for children. But yeah, this is my Harry Potter wizardry. Beautiful, beautiful wizardry. And I don't know how to like summarize this plot because I don't think the description on the back is about 
it's focusing on a character who's like a very small role in this actual plot like everything that happens is a result of him but he has like such small amount of page time that it feels completely irrelevant so i will read you the description they have on storygraph because i need to know what this book is about and also i need you to have these like here's the second book of the series look how much i loved and read this book I think my nan bought me this one. This is like the first book someone ever gifted to me. We went and typed WH Smith and we picked it out together. And she was like, oh, you can save it to read it for some holidays. And then I went back to her house and I read probably just like half of it in the afternoon. And she was like vaguely mad at me that I didn't save it, but I love this series so much. So anyway, magic. Septimus Heap, the seventh son of the seventh son, disappears the night he is born, pronounced dead by the midwife. That same night, the baby's father, Silas Heap, comes across an abandoned girl in the snow, a newborn girl with violet eyes. Who is this mysterious baby girl and what really happened to the Heap's beloved son? This is the first book in this completely enthralling series and it's this fantastical journey of like very quirky characters and the magical charms and potions and spells. And ultimately this one here is about lost and rediscovered identities as we find out what happened to Septimus Heap and the midwife's son and this little baby found in the snow. And again, it has so much humour and heart. I'm completely in love with it. And I do love when I reread the childhood favourite and it's still equally a favourite, like 14 years later now. When does I think this came out in like the nine I was gonna say this came out in the nineties. This specific one, the jacket art is copyrighted with 2005. Also, it doesn't feel like particularly aged or dated at all. Because <laughs> unlike Harry Potter, this book here has like no real world reference at all. It's completely in its own thing, so it like there's no age references in here. It's also like not I don't think it's hugely problematic in a way, except a bit at the start where a wizard's looking in the mirror in her enchanted mirror and it tells her to make her skinnier. It's like a bit of like a Fat Shaney vibe, but other than that, it is largely non problematic for a children's book from a some time ago from 20 years ago and that is all the books i read this month i'm gonna say compound fracture was probably my favorite because i don't think i had like any actual issues with it at all it just wasn't my favorite out of this author's bibliography in a sense okay i am getting shiny and shiny so let us wrap this up thank you guys so much for watching this video please make it know in the comments below if you've read any of these books at all before if you're going to pick up compound fracture when it comes out and also pl please read my childhood favorite book Thanks so much for watching this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye!